Okay, so I'm supposed to, to sing in this microphone here. So um, I'm very happy to see the dedicated physics uh, students and faculty who decided to be here and learn about uh, neutron stars instead of listening to David Cameron saying how he managed to get the UK out of, uh, out of the EU. His talk is taking place right now. Anyway, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ferian Ozel uh, from the University of Arizona. She received her PhD, well, undergraduate at Columbia and then PhD at Harvard, working on uh, QED effects in neutron stars. She was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton and before she moved to be faculty at the University of Arizona in 2004. Now, uh, she has made many contributions in the field of high energy astrophysics, and she has many awards. She's an APS fellow and received the Mariah Gobert Minor Award. Uh, she received the Radcliffe Fellowship. She was a Miller visiting professor at Berkeley, and currently she has a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she's at Harvard for the year. So uh, she will be talking to us about a new era of compact objects. Thank you, Sava, and thank you all of you for being here. I do realize I had stiff competition with David Cameron, and I'm very glad that you chose to hear about compact objects and astrophysics. So um, I will tell you about some of the work that I've been doing on um, compact objects, the co concentrating mostly on neutron stars, going a, a little bit into the dividing line between neutron stars and black holes, something that I've been interested in for many years. So just to introduce you to the Arizona group, instead of putting mug shots, um, this is from a recent camping trip we had up at Mount Lemmon. Those of you who know Tucson um, know that there are beautiful campsites. And um, Carolyn, I'm going to talk about her work, Miki's work, some of CK's work. Let's see, who am I missing? Um, I'm not going to talk much about David's work. And you see there are also some astronomers in training there um, that haven't actually written papers yet, but they will hopefully soon. <clears throat> so I know that you don't get to hear too much about compact objects. I'm going to start a little bit by talking about why compact objects are interesting, um, both from the astro ast astronomy astrophysics point of view, how they are central to a lot of the phenomena that we observe in the universe. And this is a physics department, so from the physics point of view, what is it that compact objects can teach us? So um, compact objects are the term that I'm using collectively for neutron stars and black holes. And they are the outcomes of stellar evolution and explosion. So what we learned since, we were, uh, since I was in grad school and, ma and many years prior to that is that massive stars, when they evolve, um, and finish their lives, go through a supernova explosion, and the outcome of that can be a neutron star or a black hole. So in some ways, we can do uh, astrophysical forensics. By looking at the outcomes, we can look at what we don't understand about stellar evolution and explosions, and I will get to this a little bit later. There's quite a bit we don't understand. Gamma ray bursts, the most powerful explosions in the universe, come from either coalescing neutron stars or the formation of a black hole. Our best tests of general relativity don't come from the solar system, but they come from and will continue to come from compact objects, whether this is radio pulsars, neutron stars that have a large enough magnetic field to be emitting curvature radiation, and we see those as radio pulsars or X-ray pulsars or gamma ray pulsars. Gravitational wave signals, obviously the first detection was um, last September. Uh, we're very excited about this new avenue. Um, the, the two events so far have been black hole mergers. We are expecting neutron star mergers. Black holes in galaxies play a very important role in shaping the galaxies themselves. We want to understand the central black holes. <clears throat> and something very near and dear to my heart is QCD and dense matter. Neutron star cores contain the densest cold matter in the universe. Um, so if we want to understand anything about how particle interactions change and how the composition of matter changes as we go to high densities, neutron stars are the natural place to look at. 
I won't talk about all of this. Don't panic, please. I'm just motivating what, what rich phenomena are associated with neutron stars and what, uh, how we can use them. And I'm not even listing everything. For example, neutron stars um, also place constraints on the interaction cross-sections of dark matter. Um, I talked to some of you today about that. But I'm not even going to get into those questions. <clears throat> so when I say high density, let's put this into context. What we're normally familiar with is atomic, uh, not normal atoms. So um, anything from water to something like platinum, one of the densest metals, metals on Earth, there's a factor of 20 difference in density, okay? From water to something like platinum 19 times. When we squeeze matter t further together, for further in, if we can consistently squish it down, then what happens is it's energetically more favorable for electrons to actually combine with the protons in the, in the nucleus and form neutron-rich matter. So when you go to this state, which we know exists, you emit some neutrinos and um, you make matter that is already many, many um, fat orders of magnitude denser than atomic um, density. So at this point, the density of matter is comparable to the density of the atomic nucleus. But neutron stars go further, about a factor of 10 further. So we take neutron-rich dense matter at nuclear saturation density, squeeze it further together, and we ask ourselves, what happens? Do free quarks form? Like, what are the degrees of freedom that appear in that context? Do hyperons form? Um, does, does the strange quark become part of the story there? So <clears throat> these are some questions that um, neutron star observations help address. And we're talking by now, remember I said a factor of 20 between water and one of the densest metals on Earth. We are now talking about 10 to the 14 times the normal um, atomic density. So um, clearly new physics could happen. It could be, like I said, free quarks or many other, um, many other things. So we try to understand what happens there. So from an ast astronomical point of view, astrophysical point of view, the way we form these things is by evolving massive stars. When they run out of fuel, their cores are now, the very cores are iron, and they no longer have the pressure support that is generated by nuclear reactions, then the core starts shrinking. Okay? So we say this goes on for a while, and um, after, <clears throat> after the potentially the supernova explosion, which follows when the outer layers of the star fall onto this newly formed dense core and bounce off of it and are dispersed into the um, interstellar medium. What we learn is that if particle interactions can stop the collapse, then we have a neutron star remnant. If particle interactions or any, any sort of interaction can't stop the collapse, then we form a black hole. So, so far, the story that is being told is that it's almost a linear function of the mass that you start with. If you, the more massive the star you start out with, the higher the chance that you'll end up in a black hole. So we always learned in some ways that the outcome is a monotonic function of the mass of the star that you start with. Okay? But recent calculations aren't showing this. Recent calculations actually show a proliferation based on many, many different parameters. And these are due to our lack of ability to really model mass loss in evolved massive stars. How much of the envelope actually leaves before the star even goes supernova? Or maybe it doesn't even go supernova because there is just so much material falling down that it implodes completely. We don't fully understand convection in stellar envelopes. We don't understand the effect of ro um, differential rotation. What are the core masses that are left just prior to the supernova explosion? These are open questions, believe it or not, after a, um, a century of stellar astrophysics. 
The entropy profiles turn out to be different between stars that started out with similar initial conditions, and therefore the explosions themselves turn out to be different. So there is a recent paper by Stan Woosley's and collaborators group at Santa Cruz working with the supernova explosion team at the Max Planck Institute in Garhing. And they put out new predictive models. I mean, they, they will not bet significant amounts of money on these, but the most advanced stellar evolution models coupled with the most advanced stellar explosion models predict that it's actually not a monotonic function of the pre or, or the um, zero H main sequence mass, but that these are different neutrino emissivity models, so don't worry about what these are at all, but that they tried many different models. <coughs> and this is the zero H main sequence mass, what the star was born with. <coughs> and what they found is that there is a successful explosion and an um, associated neutron star formation in these green um, windows that you see as a function of the zero age main sequence mass. There was an explosion, but a black hole formed due to fallback in some of the models, and a complete implosion and a black hole formation in all the windows that you see in black. So clearly, the details of the neutrino emission and transport change where these windows are. But in each and every model, you see windows of neutron star formation and windows of black hole formation. Obviously, here they have to assume something for the cutoff mass, which itself is an unknown. And it's one of the problems that I'm trying to get at. So if you look at something like this, you expect to see in the remnant population potentially islands coming from these different um, mass, the different mass ranges that gave rise to um, those compact objects. Is that the case? So um, one of the stories that we're, in, in short, trying to un um, unearth is what are the, what is a predictive model for outcome of a massive star? When does a neutron star form? What is the maximum mass of a neutron star? And when does a black hole form? There's, of course, an associated question of what are black hole environments. This is a completely different project um, called the Event Horizon Telescope that I'm uh, heavily involved in, but I'm not going to be able to talk about today. So when I say the new era of compact objects, what I mean is that we are now at a point where we can make use of different types of astrophysical data to carry out this um, forensic operation. What we look at are neutron star and black hole masses and their clustering, um, if any. We look at neutron star radii. I will tell you um, our efforts in the last decade of trying to measure the, uh, the sizes of neutron stars as a handle on their interiors. There is a very exciting possibility of measuring the moment of inertia of at least one, potentially more neutron stars which is going to have a very, very direct implication for the composition and interactions of the interior. And of course, the new gravitational wave signals, both from black holes and neutron stars, will help us pin down the physics and of compact objects and stellar evolution. So let me go right to, so I'm, I'm going to try and go through these and give you some idea of what is encoded in um, in those data sets and what we hope to measure <clears throat> or what we have measured so far. Masses, how do we weigh neutron stars? Well, we weigh them when they're in binaries, um, very typical uh, measurement of binary parameters. And in addition, um, we can also measure what are called post-Keplerian parameters because these binaries have general relativistic effects. And um, depending on the co configuration of the binary, whether it's edge on and we measure, measure Shapiro delays, or <clears throat> we measure the orbital period decay um, in systems that we can monitor for a decade or longer, we can actually get very, very good constraints on the masses of the neutron stars in these systems. 
A subset are double neutron stars. Both members of the binary are, ne are neutron stars. And those are the ones typically <coughs> where we can measure the post-Keplerian parameters very precisely. And that's <coughs> reflected in the fact that when I plot the likelihood over the mass for these handful of, <coughs> of um, neutron stars, even though the errors are Gaussian errors, they practically look like delta functions. So the, they are extremely narrow. They are typically measured to the third digit after um, the third significant digit. So there is a group called millisecond pulsars. These typically have white dwarf companions. Um, and they have gone through some kind of accretion phase, and they have spun up at, as a result of these. So their periods are in the milliseconds. And they are extremely good clocks. Um, there, you can see that their errors are also Gaussian, and um, the measurements are, are quite precise. So we come to the black holes. Again, the only time we can measure the mass of a black hole, especially a stellar mass black hole, is if it's in a binary. Otherwise, there, there could be a whole bunch of um, isolated black holes out there, but we have no way of measuring their masses if we don't have dynamical effects. So those you can see, um, there are a whole bunch of well-measured masses, and there are some with quite large un uncertainties. This is the mini quasar within our own galaxy, GRS 1950. OK, so when data start to build up like this, then you can use statistical inference tools and say, what is the underlying distribution of compact object masses from which these data could have been drawn? And um, we've, we've done many different analyses on these. We have Bayesian inference techniques. We try to fold in uh, measurement uncertainties. We try to fold in selection effects. And we ask, OK, what is the underlying distribution of these objects? Back in 2010 and 12, um, we published a few papers where we divided the population into double neutron stars, the two, both members of the binary being neutron stars, the recycled ones. And we showed that double neutron stars indeed are a lower mass peak than the recycled ones. And at that time, we explained this as a result of accretion that the recycled neutron stars have gone through. Don't worry about this for now. This is a, another group of um, neutron star sources. Now, since then, I mean, you might think 2012 isn't that far back. Surely things haven't changed. Well, they have. It's an amazing field where the rate of discovery is, um, is mind-boggling. I will show you in a second. So now, what I'm doing here is taking this distribution of this um, solid line here, the recycled neutron star mass distribution, which is the highest mass peak in the neutron stars, at least that we knew of in 2010 and 12. And I'm comparing it to what we inferred for black holes. Our idea was that we would go up to a mass where neutron stars would end, and we would go down to a mass where black holes would start, and this would be the dividing line between neutron stars and black holes. So we were hoping to get at the intrinsic dividing line between like the maximum mass of a neutron star through um, this analysis. Instead, we uncovered something completely unexpected. There is a mass gap, a sizable mass gap, between the heaviest known neutron star and the lightest known black hole. Not just that, but when you ask the question for the entire black hole population, just look at this dashed line for now. Um, this one is integrated over the entire parameter space, but let's concentrate on this. It says that the intrinsic distribution cuts off at six solar masses and exponentially decays toward high masses. That is understandable because the mass function of stars decays towards high masses. So that exponential decay is kind of expected. What is not expected is for the sharp cutoff to be in, in the 5 to 6 solar mass range. So we were kind of at a loss. I mean, we suggested a few possibilities, and um, 
we didn't know it beyond anything beyond that. <clears throat> so I said this is a mind-bogglingly active field. Um, this is the rate of discovery from a recent annual reviews article that I've written with Paula Frere. This is the number of millisecond pulsar discoveries as a function of time. And of course, um, a discovery doesn't translate into an immediate mass measurement, but certainly when the rate of discoveries goes up like this, the rate of mass measurements follows pretty closely. So if in 2010 we used the data up to there, in 2017 <coughs> or in late in 2016, we had far more measurements that came from those discoveries because the post-Keplerian parameters other than the pi um, orbital period decay could be measured. So this is now what the mass distribution of neutron stars looks like. So given that that's the sample increased, we started asking ourselves, even within one population, is there, is there indications for more than one peak? And remember that earlier models told us that there, it's just monotonic. Either you form a neutron star and black, or a black hole. But recent models, the most sophisticated models, tell us these islands are forming. So it's a natural question to ask also whether these are um, seen in the data with any statistical significance. So this is from a 2016 paper with John Antoniadis and, and collaborators that I was involved in. This is now just the millisecond pulsar mass distribution. And the solid line is the most, um, the highest significance fit to that intrinsic distribution. So basically, we are recovering the peak from the 2010 paper, 2012 paper, but the recent discoveries are, um, have added pretty significantly to the known pulsars between 1.7 and 1.9 solar mass range. Therefore, there is now a pretty significant peak appearing here. So um, what can we learn from this? The mass distribution is indeed multi-peaked. So if you also include the double neutron stars here, we're now talking about at least three distinct peaks in, within the compact object distribution, mass distribution, plus the black holes. We also looked into the individual systems in this peak and asked, is accretion responsible for this? And on a case-by-case -case basis, we could either rule out significant amount of accretion from a companion that moved them to the higher mass peak, or um, also could argue that accretion would have just broadened the distribution rather than giving rise to a second distinct peak. So at least a handful of members in the second peak have to be born here. We also said that M max has to be greater than two solar masses, but beyond that, the maximum mass of a neutron star has to be greater than two solar masses, but beyond that, we can't say anything. <coughs> yes? So, no, so please go ahead. So, so I understand your pain is in the distribution of solar mechanism, but how about the systematic in establishing the mass? Now? Is there a selection effect that can be described? So systematics, as far as measurement uncertain, I mean, um, systematics associated with the measurement themselves are very well under control. It's pulsar timing. We're talking about nanosecond precision. Um, we're talking about measuring several post-Keplerian parameters to the point that they're actually GR tests rather than just using the, the GR framework to measure um, the masses. So systematics from that point of view are minimal in a lot of the cases. In some, of course, the data aren't that well, but are that good, but um, then they don't contribute much significance anyway to, to the inferred distribution. Your other question is selection effects. Well, obviously, our first and foremost selection effect is that we are only measuring masses and binaries. So if one could come up with a mechanism in which supernova explosions disrupt a particular type of bi like binary and leave certain mass neutron stars isolated while preserving others, 
it would be contrived, but it would it, it could be a weakness of, of this analysis. Um, other selection effects, for example, especially in the case of black holes, we looked at are we looking at the brightest sources? And by by doing so, perhaps biasing ourselves to more massive ones, if more massive ones also end up being the brighter sources. There, we didn't find anything like that. Um, we looked at extinction. We looked, I mean, we looked at, other than binarity, anything that could bias the mass distributions into high, higher mass, lower mass, by modality, um, and we can't identify anything, is what I can say. Other questions? Okay. So, <clears throat> this is from very recent work. It's very preliminary, but um, we are now trying to combine the supernova explosion stellar evolution predictions with what we are observing. This is now the same bimodal, only millisecond pulsar curve. And this is the raw data from, um, from the um, Santa Cruz Max Planck group. Now we're convolving it with the initial mass function, applying potential selection effects, et cetera, to be able to compare the predicted outcomes to the observed distribution. And this, like I said, it's very preliminary. For example, there is a second peak that's coming out of higher masses, but since we don't fully understand it, I didn't even plot it. But there are no, there, there is no fit here. So the red is the predicted and the dashed line is the observed. So it's entirely possible that those islands that we are seeing that I sh showed you in the beginning of the talk are indeed mapping into these distinct peaks. And of course, we are not, we didn't plot the double neutron star peak here, which does show up in the simulations, which is very nice. So that's what we learned from just weighing the neutron stars. Mass measurements tell us quite a bit about what could and could not have happened in the evolution and explosion. But it still doesn't tell us too much, other than the maximum mass being close to potentially two solar masses. It doesn't tell us too much about the interior of the neutron star. So. For that, we actually have to measure sizes. The reason is that um, when we look at the equation of state of the interior, it turns out that the interior composition is best probed by the radius. In, in fact, um, you can write a lot of empirical models that show that if you want to understand the interactions and composition of the interior, the best the best parameters to, um, the best observables to focus on are the, uh, is the radius of the neutron star. So we showed that in earlier work, which I'm not going to get into. Now, how do you measure the size of an astronomical object? I mean, we're not going to take a ruler and go out there. So we do pretty much what we do for stars. I mean, for stars, really, what we do is look at the emission coming from their surfaces, we measure the flux, the distance to the star, divide by sigma um, t effective to the fourth, and that gives us the emitting area, 4 pi r squared. Okay? So pretty simple introductory astronomy. Neutron stars aren't that simple because they actually are very powerful gravitational lenses themselves. They are so compact that as radiation is emitted from their surface, I mean, the, I know a number of you work on weak lensing. This is the very strong lensing regime. Um, the light paths emerging from the surface are severely bent. So what an observer at infinity sees is subject to that lensing correction. If we were working in the Schwarzschild metric, so neutron star not rotating, spherically symmetric, etc., this correction would be what you see in the parenthesis. So the inferred emitting area by an observer at infinity would be distorted by 1 minus 2 gm over rc squared to the minus 1 if the star is not rotating. Okay? <clears throat> so 
we definitely need to model the space-time if we want to really make these measurements and unfold them and get the neutron star radius out. Go ahead. Very good question. Stefan Boltzmann law is ap applicable to anything that emits thermally. It doesn't mean that the spectrum is a black body. In fact, neutron stars have atmospheres, centimeters thick atmospheres, that distort the radiation coming from the core away from a black body. So you have to model the atmosphere. You have to do the radiative transport in that pretty extreme regime where the density is high and a lot of different physics happens. And um, you have to relate what you're seeing in the spectrum, that temperature, the, what we call the spectral or the color temperature, to the actual effective temperature, which goes into the Stefan Boltzmann law. So no, we don't make the assumption that they are black bodies. We actually do very detailed modeling of the neutron star surfaces. But yes, Stefan Boltzmann law is applicable because it's thermal emission after all. Okay. Thank you for that question. So um, yeah, that's why this one, if I was giving a technical seminar, would have had T effective here, um, just to make sure that we are doing that spectral correction. OK, so this is complicated but doable because there are, there are a bunch of neutron star sources where we do see the surface, not the radio pulsars where the emission is dominated by the magnetosphere and the um, energetic charges that being accelerated and doing synchrotron em emission. But <clears throat> there are a bunch of sources where the neutron star is in a binary and is actually accreting matter from the companion and there are periods where accretion completely ceases. So um, these are called low mass X-ray binaries, but that's not important. So either we are able to look at windows in which the accretion is not ongoing and the surface is glowing after the recent accretion episode that deposited a whole bunch of heat onto the surface. <clears throat> or um, we are looking at um, I think you'll enjoy this. Neutron stars actually have thermonuclear bursts on their surface, uh, uh, the triple alpha reaction that is um, unstable. So it accretes a, a layer of helium. Hydrogen burns stably into helium under those, under those conditions. And as this layer gets compressed, triple alpha gets ignited at about 10 meters deep. Once it gets ignited, it just covers the entire surface, engulfs them in, it, it in flames. These events last about 15 seconds, sometimes 20, 30 seconds. And during that time, the whole neutron star surface is glowing. So exactly what we need to be looking at the, the size of the surface. So again, we either look at what are called quiescent periods when there is no accretion um, and no bursts, or during thermonuclear bursts where there is so much energy being produced um, in the crust that it dwarfs everything else around it. Another advantage of these types of systems is that they have low magnetic field so that they're dynamically unimportant. They don't channel the flow. They don't make hot spots on the surface. There are no footprints um, and um, little to no accretion or magnetospheric emission, which are nuisance in this case. So the radius results. What I'm going to show you are the 14 sources for which we've been able to collectively, like, I, of course, my group has done quite a large number of these, but um, this is, again, from a compilation. Um, six coming from thermonuclear bursts and eight coming from quiescent sources. In a couple of cases, you will see that the, for example, this blue contour here, that indeed is very large statistical uncertainties. It's, it's not enough photons in the X-ray spectrum to really pin down the properties of the source. But everything else that you see here is actually um, systematic uncertainties. Whether this is 
systematic distance uncertainties to globular clusters, whether this is st systematic uncertainties of the distortion in the atmosphere. Of course, we model it as well as we can and produce a range of corrections in, um, in that effective temperature. It could be um, a whole slew of reasons why um, the, there are systematic corrections. But we try to, we've been trying to beat down on these uh, while we're making these measurements or, and this modeling. So there are also contours that you can see here are, uh, that are very, very small. And overall, what you'll notice is that even though the uncertainties are large, there's actually quite a bit of clustering um, right around 10 kilometers. So what we can say is that neutron stars are not 15 kilometers, especially when you look here at the, some of the better measurements. They're really clustered around 10. If we now take all of these and ask if there was one neutron star radius, the mass radius relation was such that there was one main branch of neutron star radii. What would that be? So that's what, um, that, what we did um, in this article. And um, the radii, the combined radii, are in the 9.9 to 11.2 kilometer range, which is actually, even though the very early papers on neutron stars talked about 10 kilometers, most of the recent literature from nuclear physics and lattice QCD extensions um, talk more about 13, 14, maybe like 12 kilometers and above. So this is actually pretty constraining uh, for those reasons. And you can see now when I plot mass versus radius, all of these are different predictions with different assumptions of either quark interiors or different phase transitions. Um, some QCD um, models, as, as I mentioned. Um, there are some purely nuclear models that add um, different interactions and different amounts of symmetry energy, et cetera. So these are all theoretical calculations and mass radius relations corresponding to those. So when I say if there was one radius, what I'm referring to is the fact that really we're looking at neutron stars between one and two solar masses. And there, you see that the main track the radius is independent of mass. So in that branch, the radii are between 9.9 .9 and 11.2 kilometers, 95% confidence interval. If this is true, we've account, if it, indeed we've accounted for all the systematics and this result holds with future scrutiny, it implies that the maximum mass of a neutron star is 2.05 solar masses. So we we should not be able to find any pulsars, any other neutron stars that are at 2.1 or 2.2 solar masses. It is, it is that definitive. And indeed, currently, the record holder is 1.97 solar masses. And the, the sample has grown. So we're potentially getting to the point where um, we will be able to attack it for both from the mass side and from the radius side and definitively talk about this um, break between neutron stars and black holes. Or at least the maximum mass of a neutron star even if black holes aren't forming there. Okay, so when I flashed that, um, that slide and I said um, neutron stars are, are very um, effective gravitational lenses, and we need to do a correction based on um, the neutron star space-time. And I showed you the Schwarzschild correction formula. We are actually not applying the Schwarzschild correction formula. It's because neutron stars actually do spin around their own axes. Um, the particular sources that, I, that I'm showing you spin anywhere from, um, with frequencies anywhere from 200 hertz to about 700 hertz. At that point, the neutron star is fairly significantly distorted. So you can't make the assumption of spherical matter distribution and Schwarzschild metric exterior to it. In fact, neutron stars look more like this. You can see both poles at the same time. One side is brighter and looking bigger, <coughs> the, one, the side rotating towards you. They acquire pretty significant quadrupole, space-time quadrupoles. So we have to do 
the GRA tracing appropriately for individual sources. And this was my student Mihi Baobok's um, thesis. So in addition to actually, of course, writing down the uh, correct metric, how do we do these corrections? It's pretty computationally intensive. So we turn to GPUs in order to carry out these calculations very efficiently. I mean, obviously, it's a perfect problem for GPUs, right? You're doing ray tracing. OK, it's not computer gaming, um, which the GPUs were, were initially developed for. But it is pretty, I mean, apart from not being a flat space time, it's pretty close. It's a very highly parallelizable problem. So what you're going to see here as a demonstration of how good are GPUs for this problem is actually this is my postdoc CK. This is his hand. There is a motion sensor device. This black thing that you're seeing right below his wrist is a motion sensor device. And this is his laptop. So it's on a single GPU. And this particular compact object is a black hole that we did this movie for, but obviously we will do it for neutron star space times, et cetera. So he's going to shoot a million photons at this black hole, and we're going to watch him control the simulation and the visualization in real time. Okay, so we hand-coded signals so that um, this motion sensor device actually understands um, like, uh, commands to run our codes. So here we go initializing the simulation, and that's running time forward, solving the equations, the geodesic equations, stopping it and looking around. <clears throat> you see the photons trapped around the horizon there. Running time a little bit further and now running time backward. Why not? We can do it. And once he zooms out and runs the photons backward, you will see, well, this is the, these are the time delays that the photons experience. That's why they're lagging behind the, the actual wall of photons that came. And here you see the shadow left in the initial wall and the photons that were trapped by the black hole. So this is just for fun, obviously. <laughs> we're doing it because we can. Um, but in order to use this both for black hole simulations like this one is showing, but more importantly for this talk, for the neutron star simulations, the appropriate space times, et cetera, to be able to do the corrections right, we can't run it on a single laptop. So um, we went to the major research instrumentation grant <clears throat> that the NSF gives every so often. And uh, we were very pleased that they gave us one uh, at the University of Arizona. So we built a large GPU cluster, which put us temporarily, you know how fleeting these things are, but um, in the computing world, there is a green 500 list. What is the amount of flops you get per per watts that you consume. So we were number seven on the green 500 list for about maybe five, five six months, and then of course very quickly declined. OK, so um, we, get to, we get to do a lot of playing this way. Now, um, I'm going to show you, so what I showed you so far is one way in which we can measure radii. I said the results are between 10 and 11 kilometers. And we definitely need to verify this. I mean, we've beaten down the systematics as much as we could. But just like when it came to the cosmological parameters, if it was just the uh, lambda that, that's measured by type 1a supernovae, maybe we wouldn't believe it. CMB had to show it. Um, at the supernovae had to show it. And then we started gaining more confidence. So similarly, we, look, we attack it from the mass point of view. We attack it from the spectroscopic radius measurements point of view. But we need to verify these results somehow. So for that, we've been working on an experiment called NICER. 
And here, unlike what we choose for the spectroscopic radius measurements, we actually look at pulsars. We look at pulsars that have an, a component of the emission coming from the surface. So we, these are called X-ray pulsars, millisecond X-ray pulsars. So let me show you again what we do. This is a typical footprint of the magnetic field on the stellar surface. As the star rotates, what you see is that it leaves a particular waveform here. It's, um, it's roughly sinusoidal, but it's not a sine wave. The reason is that all that time delays that we talked about, all the quadrupole moments in the space-time, um, the Doppler boosting of the photons when they move towards us versus away from us, it gets encoded into that waveform. And by looking at that, you can figure out for a given mass what the size of the object emitting it is. And because these are pulsars, we know the mass is through independent means. So we are going to get very high signal-to-noise waveforms so that we can read off what the radius is from modeling these waveforms. A completely independent technique compared to what I described you. So this is an instrument that's going to go on the International Space Station. Um, it is an X-ray detector. Um, it's an, it ha it's um, focusing. Um, and very high time resolution, pretty good energy resolution. And our current launch date is May <coughs> of 2017. It's going to go on the, um, on, uh, the Falcon, so um, we're very happy that the last launch was actually successful. Keep fingers crossed because we, got, we were supposed to launch August of 2016, and because of the previous um, bad luck, we got delayed, but things seem to be working out now. So we have a launch date in May at this point. And they asked us if we want tickets to the, to the launch, so I'm, I'm guessing this is the real thing. Um, and in the future, so when we talk about well beyond what we can do in this decade, we are working on the successor to Chandra, the X-ray surveyor, which will have the angular resolution to, be, um, to successfully look at these neutron star sources, but far more collecting area. So some of those contours that I showed you that are actually simply low counts, um, it, they're just not bright enough. Um, something like the X-ray surveyor in the 2020s or in the 2030s, um, if we are able to build the successor to Chandra, would be able to nail down this problem very nicely. <clears throat> okay. Um, five more minutes? Yes? Okay. Because I, th this is also really fun, so I just want to talk to you about it. This is not a measurement that has been done yet, but um, it will be quite amazing when it is completed. Um, there is one system out of all the neutron star sources that I talked to you about, where not only are both components in the binary are neutron stars, but both are radio pulsars that we can see. So their beams are pointed towards us. So the system is called the double pulsar. Okay? So pulsar A, pulsar B. And obviously, since we can time both pulsars, it's an amazing test of general relativity up to some curvature and energy scale. Um, but beyond that, so this is mass of pulsar B versus mass of pulsar A. Pretty much every post-Keplerian parameter, every relativistic parameter that can be measured in a binary has been measured for the system. Because not only are both components pulsars, but the inclination of the binary with respect to our line of sight is 89 degrees. Okay? I mean, really, like, somebody ordered the system and um, nature delivered it. it. It's that good. So the Shapiro range, uh, Shapiro S parameter, the relativistic time dilation gamma, omega dots, the precession of the periastron, PB dot, every single one has been measured for the system. And this is a blow up of this region here where um, you see all of them intersecting. Now, normally, the um, 
omega dot has a moment of inertia dependent term. So when you use omega dot for a mass measurement, you neglect it because it's very small. But when you have the um, when you have such a precise measurement and every other parameter already helped you define the, the masses, then you can use this mass, the moment of inertia dependent term causes a difference between the PB dot and the omega dot. Okay? That's proportional to the moment of inertia in this case of pulsar B. So um, omega dot is already as good as it gets. All that we're waiting for, all our radio uh, observer colleagues are waiting for, is for the PB dot measurement, the orbital period decay measurement, to improve to a point where they can read, that dif read off that moment of inertia dif dependent difference. So in about three to five years' time, we're going to have a moment of inertia measurement, which is amazing because it's yet another probe. So if mass and radius are probes of the density profile of the interior, of course, moment of inertia is the, um, is the next moment up. So um, it's going to give independent constraints. This is some work my graduate student Carolyn Rayfield did, um, basically to show that without any assumptions other than knowing what the crust is, this extremely thin crust is made of, that um, general relativity itself allows us to put a lower and an upper bound on the radius given a moment of inertia measurement. Because um, if you ask yourself, what is the maximum moment of inertia that I can, that I can make in a star that is actually stable, like microscopically and macroscopically stable, it turns out to be the constant density case. If you ask yourself what is the, sorry, yeah, the maximum. If you ask yourself what's the minimum moment of inertia that I can make, it turns out to be a very dense inner shell that's just above the Buchdahl limit, like something that won't collapse into a black hole, followed by a low density, a low constant density outer shell. So this is, um, this is based on um, some earlier work by um, Sabarini and, and Hartle. So we, <clears throat> we turn that into what can we learn about the radius given the expected un uncertainties in the moment of inertia. Again, making absolutely no assumptions about the equation of state of the interior. But once we know the radius, of course, we can turn that into equation of state constraints. And um, these are not measurements. This is a proof of principle. So we picked some number out of the hat, 1.5 times 10 to the 45 in CGS. And these are different um, equations of state just for the very outer region, uh, that extremely thin layer that I showed you. So this in itself, without any other assumptions, is going to tell you the minimum radius and the maximum radius that's consistent with a moment of inertia measurement. So if this, ten, if this happens to fall where we actually did this proof of principle experiment between 12 and 14, then it is at odds with what we have so far from the spectroscopic measurements. So it's, a, again, a completely independent method with its own systematics and very minor ones at that. So we chose this range just so we wouldn't look like we, we are biased based on our previous results. Um, obviously, it can very easily be here, in which case the radius would be somewhere between um, 10 and 11 kilometers, so if this was the moment of inertia. Okay? So don't walk away thinking there is conflict. This is just some numbers we pulled out of a hat. Okay, so compact objects and gravitational wave signals also have a very intri um, intricate connection. All the gravitational wave signals that we are expecting to see with advanced uh, LIGO and, and collaborators and even with LISA um, are compact objects. And of course, all of you have seen this, the September event. Two black holes, one nearly 40 solar masses, the other at 30 solar masses. 
We didn't have anything like this in our sample. Any, any black hole that we could measure the mass for to date, or prior to this, had a normal star companion, um, which clearly uh, excluded masses, uh, must have excluded masses of this type. So um, this already opened a new window into what black hole masses could be like. And in the, in the future, I'm just going to skip this actually, um, we expect the coalescence of two neutron stars to allow the measurement of, of the tidal love number, which is the deformability of the neutron star. As two stars approach each other, the tidal effects of one cause distortions in the other, which gets uh, encoded into the waveform. And um, the tidal love number um, is one of the ways of, um, of quantifying that, uh, that deformability. So we're expecting measurements of the tidal love number, which would be the one higher moment from the moment of inertia. So we're really hoping to map out the neutron star interior with all of these different diagnostics that we have available. So this is just the movie that that is from Luciano Rezola and, and collaborators showing the merger and the, and the disk formation. Okay, so <clears throat> Instead of bullet conclusions, let me just summarize what we know in one um, <coughs> compact object inferred mass map, if you will. So I talked about the double neutron star systems with a very narrow range of masses forming the first peak in the, in the stellar evolution outcomes. I talked about two distinct peaks that are emerging in the millisecond pulsar population that are also coming out of um, the, the supernova explosion stellar evolutions. And in, even though we initially attributed these to accretion, we are now thinking that actually this is pretty close, this must be pretty close to the birth masses and accretion onto neutron stars must be quite inefficient. I talked about the gap between the highest neutron star mass that I called maximum mass and the lowest black hole mass that we're seeing in the distribution um, of, of uh, stellar mass black holes. And this is likely due to the fact that if a star can explode successfully and form, black, form neutron stars, um, the core that is left, the um, the core that is left is between 1.2 and 1.8 solar masses, whereas if it doesn't have a successful supernova explosion, the entire helium core is likely to implode, which is about six solar masses. So we're thinking of a stellar evolution origin for this gap rather than some bizarre physics happening. I talked about the LIGO black holes, which will clearly change our picture of the black hole masses in the coming few years. And I also said that this M max is, also, um, is independently predicted by the current radius measurements, which are between 10 and 11 kilometers. Something that small um, not only cannot accommodate much larger masses than about 1.95, or oh, sorry, 2.05 solar masses, which is where I've drawn that line, but at the same time, it says that our understanding of um, nuclear physics effective Lagrangians breaks down at a, at a few times the nuclear saturation density. Probably new degrees of freedom appear there. What they are, whether they are quarks or or something else needs uh, further study, but we are at least trying to verify those results through many different means, such as nicer moment of inertia measurements, etc. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question. So I said that the spin periods, the millisecond periods, are likely due to being spun up by accreting from the companion. It turns out extremely little 
mass is needed to spin them up to 600 hertz. So even if you accrete far less than 0.1 of a solar mass, um, you can still spin up the neutron star without adding significantly to its mass. So our current thinking is that it is still the preferred understanding as far as spinning up the neutron star, but it probably doesn't add much mass. Thank you for that question. Are scenarios where a superfluid might form in a neutron star still competitive, and might the moment of inertia as a present? They are still competitive. We very strongly believe that superfluidity happens. It's one way of lowering the pressure, obviously. Um, so as, the, as you increase in density, um, the pairing is likely to happen. Whether the moment of inertia measurement is going to be sensitive enough to, to um, see the superfluidity effects, I haven't looked at, but um, it depends a little bit on the uncertainty that they end up coming up with between, um, by measuring those two terms. So that's a, that's a good thing to look at, thanks. The early uh, slide that you showed uh, with the mass and the formation of black neutron stars and then black holes, that's something that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things was the gap in between, and you talked about mm -hmm. why and what happens to that mass, and I guess it either gets used or maybe it disappears if the evolution mm -hmm. process. Right. So I had um, neutron stars form later than black holes at higher masses. Yes. And that, would you explain that? Sure. So <coughs> So you're you're referring to this slide? Yes. Yes. So Several things. One is when you see these rapid oscillations between green and black, take that with a grain of salt. Those are likely to be numerical effects. All that's saying is that clearly you're right on the cusp of stability there. So depending on slight variations in your treatment or your even your initial conditions, et cetera, numerically you fall on one side or the other. But what you're referring to is this island. So um, several things happen. One, stars above a certain mass start losing mass more efficiently while they are going through their lives. So the wind-driven wind uh, mass loss is more efficient above a certain mass than below. So here, your pre-supernova mass is most likely higher than here, uh, what your pre-supernova mass is here. That's, that's the dominant effect. And second, the entropy profiles of how these stars evolve, uh, stars of different zero-age main sequence evolve, and that was the previous slide. Um, also, so I didn't explain these, but this is, the, um, the, this is the mass and the mass derivative down to a dimensionless entropy parameter um, of four at, um, so, what, what this group is finding is that there is at least another variable that comes into predicting explodability and the outcome of the explosion, if there is one. And so um, in addition to the wind mass loss that I was talking about, these probably have a different entropy profile than, than these stars. The ones that we are not sure of are these. So I briefly alluded to the fact that there is a second, more prominent peak forming in the simulations, but we are not sure, so I'm not plotting it yet. It's these guys. So these actually produce 1.8, 1.9 solar mass neutron stars. I don't know if it's real. Um, at, that, at that level, there's a lot that could be going on with, with our understanding of either the explosion or the evolution. So let's leave that for later time. Yeah. White, space white space is their sampling. 
they just don't. So, so yeah, yeah, exactly. At these masses, the initial uh, mass that they ran is becoming more and more sparse. So I, I'm actually interested in the small window left for explosion in the black hole. Mm -hmm. Is that a channel for filling, at least in small part, the gap between two and five? If you find some, some rare object that's there, could it be those few things that might actually go directly to the black hole? It could. It could, yes. I mean, one would naturally expect some of this. If there is, if again, this, is, this ends up uh, surviving after scrutiny, um, then it, the fallback that's happening, so there is an explosion, but it, it can't drive away all the material, so part of the helium core will fall back. That could end up um, in that gap, that what's currently a, a true gap, zero objects there. But it could, there could be a rare object um, that is formed by this mechanism, indeed. 